Although I've made my name as a boxer, what really matters to me is my faith. Islam is the source of my confidence and my strength. Many Muslims feel that Islam in the West is stereotyped by the mass media. They argue these images have fueled ignorance of Islam. They are non-Muslims who fear what is now the fastest growing religion on the planet. By year 2025, one third of the world's population will be Muslim. Trouble. Violence. I think they are quite militant in their stance and their approach. But who are Muslims? What do they really believe? And what is Islam? If you've ever wanted to find out just what a Muslim is, but you've been afraid to ask, then you can't afford to miss the beginner's guide to Islam. It's as simple as this. Islam means submission to God. A Muslim is a follower of Islam. And Allah is just the Arabic word for God. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity come from the same root. But they're branches. And the branches are not identical. But nevertheless, for all these differences, we have common system of ethics. We have common um, agreement about the perception of God. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Islam is how easy it is to become a Muslim. All you need to do is to believe there is only one God that created the heavens and the earth. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, was his final messenger to mankind. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. This is called the Shahada. When it is recited in front of two witnesses, you have become a Muslim. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born in Mecca in what is now Saudi Arabia in 571 AD. By the age of six, both his parents had died. He was brought up by his uncle, Abu Talib, a merchant. When he was 40, Muslims believe he received the word of God directly from the angel Gabriel. These messages continued for 23 years until his death. Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not read or write and they were written down by his companions. Together they formed the Quran. There are 104 in Surah and I've learned about 15. It's taken me about two, three years to learn. For four years? For six years. Three years for me to learn the Arabic. Like, you're not used to it. You're used to speaking like whatever language you speak, so it's quite hard at first. As well as the Quran, the other sacred sources are the Sunnah and the Hadith. Hadith comes from the word haddasa, is to speak, the speech of the Prophet. The Sunnah is the way of his conduct. It covers his own mother, manner of living. So the Sunnah really is his actions. The most common sound associated with Islam 
is the call to prayer, the Adhan. Prayer is the second pillar of Islam. A Muslim should pray five times a day in the direction of Mecca. Men and women pray separately in mosques, but you don't have to pray in a mosque. Wudu amounts to preparation that is necessary before making salah. It washes away the sins, prepares me mentally and spiritually for the act of worshipping my Lord. Okay, having made wudu, what I then do is ensure that my clothes are clean, that the area in which I intend to pray is clean, and I then begin the prayer with, with what is called takbir takhreem. Allahu Akbar. Which is Allah is the greatest. And I then begin the recitation of Surah Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Having done this, we then recite um, an optional portion of the Quran. Having done that, I then enter Ruku, and which is the bowing position. Allah Akbar. In this position, I'd glorify Allah and say, Subhana Rabbi al which means, Glory be to my Lord the Tremendous. And then I'd return to a standing position. Which means, All praise is due to our Lord. And then I'd take up the sujood position. Whilst in the sujood position, I'd recite, Subhana Rabbi al A'la, which means, Glory be to our Lord the Most High. The sitting position is called Tashahud, and I'd give salam first to the right, then to the left. Assalamu alaikum. Is um, peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah. And the persons I'm addressing with that salam, a greeting of peace, are the angels on my right and on my left, as well as my fellow worshippers. The third pillar of Islam is something very close to my heart. It concerns the welfare of poor people on earth. The Quran specifies that all Muslims who can afford to are obliged to give to the needy amongst us. Muslims are expected to pay up to 2.5% of their wealth each year. I prefer not to consider it as a tax. Um, as a third pillar of Islam, it's quite clearly established as an act of worship. Uh, so it really is a matter of the individual sitting down in a quiet room somewhere, calculating his wealth, his or her wealth, and making that contribution. So to say it's a tax is not quite correct because in Muslim countries you may in fact have a tax system which is completely separate to the zakat system. This has been done throughout Islamic history and in the past there are examples of uh, zakat being collected to such an extent that the Muslims at that time who were responsible for distributing it couldn't find enough poor people. It was actually so well managed and uh, the, the consciousness amongst Muslims that they must give it was so clear that there was so much that the, the rulers at that time had to find Muslims further abroad to give their zakat to because within their own areas there were no deserving cases. Muslims are not only expected to give to the poor, they also have to know what it feels like to be hungry. Fasting is the fourth pillar of Islam. Once a year, Muslims fast for a month. This is known as Ramadan. From sunrise to sunset, they must abstain from food, drink, sexual relations and smoking. There isn't a feeling that I could describe which is better than breaking your fast when the first date, because it's, it's good to open your, your fast. The kids enjoy it because at school their friends all fast and it's a bit of a challenge for them and, and they do enjoy it. It's good for them as well to do it at an early age. Many, many people, they will they'll fast for a day, maybe non-Muslims will fast for a day. Uh, or sometimes, even myself, you go without breakfast and you'll go without lunch and by the time you get home it's maybe been 12, 14, 16 hours and you've not eaten anything and you think, well I can empathise with 
the poor, the people in Africa and India and Bangladesh. But one day is nothing. It's when you're into the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth day, that's when it starts taking effect. That's when you, your body almost starts rejecting food as well because it's not used to it. After Ramadan, many Muslims from all around the world prepare for the fifth and final pillar of Islam, the Hajj. Every Muslim should perform the Hajj at least once in their lifetime. To take part in Hajj, Muslims should be sane, reasonably healthy and able to provide for their families while they're away. Muslim women must be accompanied either by their husbands or a man they are legally unable to marry, such as their father or brother. Women can also go as part of specially organised groups. Each year, about 20,000 British Muslims perform Hajj. When you arrive in Saudi Arabia, you enter a state of Ihram, which means that there are certain prohibitions uh, that you have to observe. And the men are dressed in two white sheets. The women wear just their normal clean clothes. And then you proceed to Mecca, where you make circumambulation of the holy um, house of God, the Kaaba. After staying in Mecca for a few days, then you travel out to the valley of Minna. And this is really the time for Hajj, when you go out to Minna. You stay there for one night and then you go to um, a large place called the Plain of Arafat. And this is the most important and key significant day of, of Hajj. If you miss Arafat, you've missed your Hajj. Here in the UK, it's estimated there's about two million Muslims. When I hear the word uh, Muslim in Islam, uh, I think of the Far East and Asia and uh, what's been on the news recently. I don't know much about it at all. A section of my student population, I suppose. It's estimated there are 1.2 billion Muslims around the world. And most of them are outside the Middle East, sometimes to be found in countries such as America, where by 2010, Islam will become the second largest religion. The sects that came into Islam came as a result of political, um, political disputes. After the death of the Prophet, there was a dispute amongst the Muslims who should succeed him. It's not that we're talking about two separate communities and never the twain will meet at all. That's not the case at all. In fact, the way to imagine it is to imagine a pie chart with two circles that overlap. And there is so much similarity between some members um, of these groups and there are differences as well. I want you to come on. What should our response be? What did you say? What did you say? There are people who call themselves Muslims, but many other Muslims may not, in fact, regard them as part of Islam, uh, such as the, uh, the Ahmadiyya and uh, the Nation of Islam. People uh, argue that they have beliefs which are not acceptable to the majority of Muslims. Now, there is also a trend in the, in the Muslim world, which is the Sufi. Sufism or mysticism is an attitude that actually cuts across all the schools of thought. So you find Sufis amongst the Shia, you find Sufis amongst the Sunnis, you find Sufis amongst everyone. <laughs> The concept of jihad has come to be understood as a holy war, but really it means striving to serve God. Jihad took a wider meaning in Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ pointed out that jihad starts with yourself. That means you actually struggle and strive against your inclinations to do the wrong things. <laughs> One of the biggest personal struggles required in Islam is a constant search for knowledge.
it is compulsory to every Muslim male and female to seek knowledge. Every time you wear a spectacle, you must remember the man, Al Hassan ibn al Haytham, the father of optics. Can you imagine the world without having the Arabic numerals that we use today? One, two, three, four, five, six. This is Arabic numerals. The Latin numerals that we have, I, X, L, and you couldn't possibly have made any serious mathematical calculations. Many symbols in uh, astronomy, there are hundreds and hundreds of stars that we use today that are originally in Arabic language. See, what I'm holding in my hand is the most sophisticated computer of those days. It's like hang having a Pentium 4 laptop hanging on the wall. This is an astrolabe. For instance, in here you point this towards the sun and you make sure that the light passes through two pinholes uh, and, and that will give you the location of where you are. So it's like your GBS system today using satellites. Look at any book, the first four or five pages, they tell us about Pythagoras, Archimedes, Aristotle, Galenos and so on. And then there is a, a gap for about a thousand years. We're told that that thousand years was the dark ages. The world was living in complete darkness. Was Europe living in darkness? There is about a thousand years missing of science history. And that is the history of Muslims. The growth of Islam around the world has led to clashes with other faiths and cultures, the biggest one being the Crusades. Crusades were launched by um, by people in Europe, by particular Pope in Europe, uh, with the aim of wresting the, the Jerusalem uh, from the Muslims. These people conquered Palestine and Jerusalem very easily because the Muslim world was as divided as it is now. They considered that the Muslims were not human beings. They murdered 70,000 people. And according to their own chronicles, their horses waded up to their knees in the blood of the Saracens, or the Muslims, as they called them. Now, they controlled Jerusalem for 90 years. Afterwards, they were expelled, and gradually they were defeated after something like 200 years. As widespread as the faith is, there's no longer a leader in the Islamic world. Many different cultures across the world have influenced Islam. So if you didn't know the difference between your ayatollahs and your imams, check this out. Obviously, in Britain, UK law applies, but the Muslims have their own law, which is called the Sharia. If you study Muslim law or the Sharia, you begin by the laws governing your acts of worship, your relationship with God. That has to be essential element of your study. And then the law of contract, the law of marriage and divorce, uh, the law of the penal code, uh, virtually every aspect of what you may call law is covered by the Sharia. <laughs> I find it very difficult to cope with the idea that um, women have to be um, 
covered up. They think women are second class citizens. They cover them up and stuff like that, which I think is a little bit harsh. They should show their beauty. <laughs> There are those in the West who say Islam represses women. If that's the case, why do so many Muslim women say Islam is liberating? The role of women in Islam, I think, is a topic that irritates a lot of women in Islam because they don't like to be thought of as separate entities. We follow the same pattern, we do the same things as, as men. We just like to think of ourselves really as being Muslims. Unfortunately, our culture made it respectable for a man to be hostile towards his wife they think that this manly. If you're manly, then you control and you order women about. This is nothing to do with Islam at all. It's really to do with the culture. Islam insisted that the women have to be treated kindly. The Prophet ﷺ said, because the, the Arabs also used to treat the women badly, and they used to, to kill the women when they were infant. So the Prophet said, if a man had three daughters, and he looked after them, and treated them with kindness, then paradise is his for sure. Hijab is a covering. It's a sign of modesty. It's a sign of being a Muslim woman. It's basically the covering of everything apart from your face and your hands doesn't stop you doing anything. I mean, all it is, is to cover your body. I mean, it's just clothes. It's not going to stop you from working. When I dress like this, I don't dress for men. I don't dress for people who want me to, you know, who want me for my looks rather than for who I am, rather than the brains I have. As the first Muslim to enter House of Lords, it was very, very important that I was able to say, in the name of Allah, I, Paula Manzila, Baroness Uddin, do swear by Almighty Allah that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Islam came with being practical as a, as a person rather than a woman or a man. So I think I grew up knowing, thinking, practicing, you know, being a Muslim. I need no Western feminist ideals to inspire me there. Within the 1400 years of development of Islam, every right that I would want as a woman in Britain is afforded me in Islam. One of the most confusing parts of Islamic law for many Westerners is the fatwa. The word fatwa entered into the languages as a result of the Mr. Rushdie's incident. But fatwa is simply a legal opinion. A legal opinion can be issued by a scholar. It has to be a scholar, a qualified scholar. Not anyone in the street can make a fatwa. So a legal fatwa would be binding only on the mufti, on the person who makes it. It's not necessarily acceptable, not, not universally accepted, because there is no ex cathedral, there is no one, no pope to tell us what to do. And anyone can challenge any um, scholar, however high his position might be. When you think of the word halal, most people just think you're talking about meat, but it goes much deeper than that. The word halal means permitted. The word haram means forbidden. Islam isn't just about your do's and don'ts. There's a whole system of economics. Islam is against the concentration of wealth in a few hands. Islam also insists that no Muslim should go hungry in a society. The law of monopoly against monopoly 
was instituted in Islam 1400 years ago. Money does not make money in Islam. Money has to be risk to make money. And only work and risk can give you money. It's not just theory. It's actually happening here in Britain today. Islam forbids Muslims to exploit others by charging interest on loans. I am publishing uh, Islamic children books. The religion of Islam does not allow interests to be taken in form of loans or anything. Services provided by the Islamic Business Center uh, allow this. Um, it was a, a loan without interest, uh, which is in accordance with the Islamic belief. I think the religion is probably more central to their culture than it is than Christianity is. Fasting, um, sort of uh, towards the what we would call Christmas and Christians. I think it's a 40-day celebration, where obviously you're not allowed to eat during the days of uh, during the hours of uh, uh, light, and I think you can then eat certain things outside of those hours. The day Friday to Muslims is what Sunday is to Christians. So there it is, the beginner's guide to Islam. I know there's a lot to remember here, but then there's a lot more to Islam and Muslims than meets the eye. Before I sign off though, here's a few words from some more British Muslims. I want them to think about Muslims as uh, peaceful people, as uh, kind people, friendly people, and helpful people. It's not about um, Islam versus the world or anything like that. It's not about fundamentalism. It's not about force. It, whoever wants to be a Muslim becomes a Muslim at his own will. No one forces someone to become a Muslim. It all derives from ignorance, what people read in the papers. You know, people, you, know you see something, you read it. If you don't go into it in depth, then you're not going to know. Islam to me means happiness. And I think other people should think happiness as well. It's a reform of society and communities. So this is what I hope the British people realise that. Peace. Yes. The press, it's sadly, it's all against Islam. And people who think this way about Islam, they shouldn't rush into conclusion. They should read and finish the story. Before I was a Muslim, I was filled with misconceptions and preconceptions. When I travelled in Muslim lands, I, I met a wonderful welcome and I was more secure than I'd ever been anywhere else in the world. And hopefully this is the future of England as well. And, and Islam has taken root here and it's growing. And inshallah it will spread and, and people will come to know what it is through Muslims and through people who embody it. And then they'll find that they have nothing to fear except for Allah. And if you fear Allah, you don't fear anything else. This season continues next on BBC Two with a home front Islamic style makeover. And if you'd like to take part in community events that complement Islam UK, call free phone 0800 011 011 or visit the website at bbc.co.uk slash Islam.